Welcome to this special edition of C++ Weekly. We're going to review Borland Turbo C++ 3.0. So Borland was very popular in the late 80s and early to mid 90s with their Turbo projects. You had Turbo C++, Turbo C, Turbo Basic, Turbo Pascal, and they all had this characteristic interface for their IDE that looks like this. And if we can see here about Borland Turbo C++ 3.0, it was released in 1992. So we are looking at, at the time of this recording, a compiler that is 24 years old. And as you can see, there are uh, fairly many options here. We've got a built-in version of grep, which I find to be interesting, turbo assembler and a debugger and a profiler built in. We're not going to really hit on any of these extra tools today. And we've got regular, you know, copy, edit, paste, clipboard functionality, and a debugger built into it, and a built-in compile tool. So from the IDE, we can write code to compile it, and we'll see that in a second. A built-in debugger and project management, so you can have multiple files, and a fairly good number of options most of which I probably don't really know exactly what they mean because I didn't really do a lot of programming in the DOS days. Not from tools like Borland C++, anyhow. So you could choose, you know, what kind of memory model you had when you were compiling here, which I find fun. So tiny is if you only had 64K of RAM available. So that's very tiny, even by PC standards. And huge goes all the way up to the gigantic one megabyte possible, which by today's standards is ridiculously small for an application of, of any reasonable complexity. Then you had some random um, other things like whether or not you want to do word alignment, unsigned characters, if you want to create a string table in your program and merge um, static strings together, and pre-compiled headers, which I find interesting that they were supporting that back in 1992. What else do we have? So do we want to continue on warnings, essentially, errors or just fatal errors? Uh, do we want to run the linker and the librarian? Let's go back into our compiler settings here. A few number of options. Let's, uh, it would have, so back in the day, if you weren't familiar with this, Intel processors didn't come with math coprocessors. So if you wanted to do any floating point operations, the emulation mode is what's selected here by default, and that would actually do floating point operations in software. But you can say, no, no, I've got a 287, so you had the 8086, and the 8087 was the coprocessor that went with it. The 286 was the next generation 16-bit uh, CPU, and then the 287 was the coprocessor that went with it, and you had uh, also the 387. By the time you reached the 486 range, the math coprocessor was built into it, basically. So let's put this up on 287, because that's fancy, and say that we can use 286 enhanced instructions, not just the ones that are available on the 8086. And that doesn't really matter for the demos we're going to show today. And then we, uh, I'm not going to go through all these, but we had C++ optimization options. So did you want to suppress redundant loads? I don't know what that means. Do you want to uh, jump optimization, eliminate redundant jumps and optimize branches? That sounds pretty useful, but we're going to leave it off for now just to kind of see what the compiler did by default for us. And then just like modern compilers, do you want to optimize for size or do you want to optimize for speed? We're going to leave it on speed. All right, let's, let's go from here and let's go ahead and write out a Hello World program. So this is our pretty standard Hello World program, and we're going to go ahead and compile it, and we get three errors. So you have all the features that you would expect from a modern IDE here. We can flip through all of the errors that we have, and we can, you know, correct them. So unable to open include file IO stream. So this was before we had actually standardized on not having extensions in the standard library headers. So now we compile, we add .h, and we get Type qualifier std must be a struct or class name, and that means this is before namespace support. So now we compile, we get one warning and no errors. So we see that main is expected to return a value. And, and here's something I have not yet tried when I've been playing around with this, but let's see. 
Yes. So it's actually possible to declare main as void instead of doing the default return value of an integer on main as you would expect today. So this compiles and now we can drop down to the shell and we can run test. Let's clear the screen. Run test and we get hello world back out. So let's write a quick for loop. That compiles and it should do the obvious expected thing of printing 0 through 4. So everything works like we expect. But there's an interesting uh, extra little thing here in that our variable that we've declared in our for loop is actually leaked outside of the for loop. So we can say if we wanted to put i equals 3 here, i equals 3, and compile, now we get a compiler error because we've redefined i. This is definitely not something that a modern C++ developer would be used to. But for the fun of it, we'll just return i from our main here. So now that compiles. And as you'll notice, these compile and run passes are very fast. Now to be fair, I'm running this on a really much more modern computer than you would have back then, but apparently this has always been something that was quite usable. So we know that we don't have namespace support, and if we try to use one, the compiler just throws its hands up. Declaration syntax error, it has no idea what to do with this. So we're just going to remove that. And let's go ahead and make a struct, and we're going to call it s. And now what we want to do is play around with some return value optimization. And this is something that C++ developers ask about, like, can I rely on return value optimizations? So we've got a compiler that's 24 years old, and we've turned off most of the optimization things. We, the code generation has been turned up. It's creating, you know, 286 code. But we turned off the other optimizations. So let's see what it does. We're going to create some debug statements so that we know when copy, assignment, and construction is occurring. I'm going to roll those out now. All right, now we should get some sort of feedback from the compiler at runtime uh, as to whether or not we're doing copy assignment and copy construction and destruction and default construction. So start with something simple. We're just going to create an S on the stack here, and we'll compile. And then we'll execute this, and we see that we've got one S constructed and one S destructed. So all right, what do we try next? Let's try creating a function that returns an object of type s. So we're going to default construct an s and return it. And then here we're just going to say s equals get an s. That compiles, no warnings or errors. And we can see that we're still constructing and destructing exactly one object of type S. So even in 1992, this type of return value optimization has already occurred. And this might surprise some C++ developers, and it definitely surprised me when I was first learning C++. I expected to see here the construction of an S, the copy of an S out of the function, and the assignment of an default constructed S. I expected to see lots and lots of work, but really the compiler says, no, 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 this is stupid, we're just going to do this once. So this is equivalent, should be equivalent, to if we did this. Oh, and that's interesting, actually, and surprises me, that that's actually doing this kind of copy construction is actually less efficient than what you would expect to be an assignment operation. So I've always thought that this code is more readable in the first place. So this is back to what we expect it to be. 
Now we're doing return on the return statement we're constructing our object. Now what if we do what would be today called named return value optimization? So we're going to name an object of type S, default constructed on the stack, and then return it. And we'll see what we get. And here we can see that we actually get the copy construction and we get two destructors again. So the copy must be happening on the return here. So that's not as efficient as you would expect it to be with a compiler today, but it works. And as you can see, this, this IDE is actually quite usable. You can, to be able to look through all of the warnings and errors very easily with the IDE, click on it and get to the line that you expect. Um, I'm, I'm impressed and the compile speed is good. It's kind of this level of C++ where we've got operator overloading and we've got the normal functions we would expect and some of the standard library and maybe we can try, I haven't tried this either, how much of the standard library we have. I don't know, I don't think we have the STL yet. 1992 is a long time ago. Oh, uh, that's, oh, we don't have templates, so we can't have the STL. So there's no templates, there's no STL, but there is um, IO streams, which I find interesting. So you've got operator overloading and you've got function overloading, which would have been new from C to C++, but there's a lot missing here. But this is apparently a tool that's still used uh, by some people. So uh, there you have it. This is Borland Turbo C++ 3.0 released in 1992. Be sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and check out any of the links below.